Susan, I am so delighted to have you today to talk about some of the topics that are near and dear to me. And before we even get started and start talking about what we're going to be talking about, I wanted to ask you a little bit about you, <laughs> a little bit, tell us a little bit about yourself. And also, how did you get to be doing what you're doing today? Beautiful. Well, thanks for the question and thanks for the invitation to join you. I'm I'm really um, honored. So kind of the quick and dirty of it, if you will, is I've always been interested in like the psychology of why human beings do what they do ever since I was maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old. I knew my purpose at a very young age. It has to do with um, building harmony within oneself. And as part of that, how that extends and expands to building harmony external of oneself. And, um, you know, I, I went to college, I did the typical kind of, you know, um, journey when you think about it, uh, from the standpoint of like, you know, being raised in the USA and, you know, you go to college and then you go out and you get your job and you do your thing. And I actually started in advertising and marketing in one of the biggest advertising agencies in Boston, actually. And, um, um, when I was on maternity leave, actually, with my first daughter, um, I just felt like there was something missing in kind of the corporate arena. And I didn't like, I didn't know what that was. And at the same time, um, when I was on maternity leave and, and coming from a place of curiosity around this thing that I felt was missing, I actually started my own business. And what I realized as I was starting that business with it was that the thing that was really missing in more of the corporate kind of arena, if you will, was the human condition. Mm -hmm. And so how could I, um, again, link to a purpose of building harmony within and external, create spaces where we could bring the human condition back into business. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that's how I started when I was 28 years old. Fast forward a few years, um, I ended up answering a very obscure ad in the classified section of um, my local newspaper. Um, and the ad was for a transcriptionist hmm. for a company called the Center for Generative Leadership. I had no clue what that was. I thought it had to do with elderly, <laughs> like older right. people, right? Oh, how Long story short, that's where I met uh, Joseph Jaworski, who is um, a, a, a thought leader in the domain of leadership development and um, yeah, I started as his transcriptionist and um, then I moved forward uh, in the organization and eventually, you know, got all my credentials um, in coaching and facilitating and actually working with clients and building opportunities to um, help people unleash the fuller potential of themselves in a way that aligns with who they are in a way that links to, again, that purpose piece around harmony, but also um, links to how we can together co-create opportunities where through that harmony, if you will, we're inspiring and creating conditions in business to where people feel engaged and fulfilled and valued so how do you think you knew your purpose so early? Because so many people, and I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I felt the same way, but people ask me, well, I have no idea what that is at, at a young age. How do you think that happened that you knew that? I was like five years old. Mm -hmm. I lived in the Midwest and my parents were really awesome at taking us on these different excursions on the weekends. So um, one day we were in our Brady Bunch station wagon and it was a rainy day and we stopped at a stoplight and I was in the passenger side, you know, behind my mom. And I looked to my right out the window, which was again, um, because it was raining, the window was streaked with um, all these raindrops. Mm -hmm. And I saw a billboard and the billboard was of a native American in full headdress. And he was standing in front of a mound of litter and there was a tear in, in his eye. Mm -hmm. I know that. So, yeah. Right. Oh. And so that tear linked to the raindrops on the window kind of for me became tears of the world. Mm -hmm. And in my childlike mind, I just knew that I was here somehow to play a role in helping people to connect with each other in, in, in ways that, you know, made them feel happy. That would make them smile. Mm -hmm. That would come from a place of love. And so then when I fast forward that and I kind of put it more into like adult language in a way, 
what, what happened for me that day was I knew that I wanted to play a role, consciously play a role in helping people to find kind of that harmony within themselves as a way to then um, co-create that with, with, with others. And and there's so much that we could talk about. I mean, I think we could do a whole episode on this because I think <laughs> it's so, um, it's fascinating how we get these signals and we get these messages and we forget them or we ignore yes. them or we don't pay attention. And so when we talk about you and what you do and I, what I do know about you is you're one of the whatever you want to call experts, right? Whatever an expert is um, on the process and the practice of dialogue, which has a lot to do with harmony and a lot of things that you're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, because people hear the word dialogue and they hear, they think it's a conversation, right? That's right. what immediately people think. So talk to us a little bit about what is the practice and the process of dialogue and the way that you practice it and and how that can help people in organizations awesome so I, I really appreciate this question because the premise for what I've been learning about dialogue comes from a quantum physicist by the name of uh, Dr. David Bohm mm -hmm. and um, David Bohm basically was uh, one who if you will prove the efficacy of what it means to be interconnected all living, all living things being interconnected. Um, and he did this from a quantum physics perspective. However, during the last 10 years of his life, he dedicated um, what he learned from his expertise in quantum science and applied it to human dynamics and how we all might, through that interconnectedness, find ways to communicate that could allow for all different opinions and perspectives to exist in one container as a way to, in his words, birth new realities. Mm. I didn't know about Bohm's work really from the quantum physics perspective, again, linked to what I was sharing earlier about just being so curious psychologically, right? right? About why people would do what they do, do. What they do. I learned about David Bohm through um, his therapist, whose name was um, Patrick Damare. Oh. And how Patrick Damare, who was actually the father of group therapy, had some sort of influence on Bohm, both as a therapist, but also as an opportunity to learn about the group dynamics, to be able to take all the different things that happen to us when we're in pairs and groups and create a space where there would be more egalitarian mm -hmm. opportunities, right? What I've learned is to your point, dialogue is not about a conversation. It involves conversation, but for me, dialogue is actually a way or a state of being. Mm -hmm. I had a business partner who unfortunately is deceased, um, but he, he shared something with me and, and others in our company many, many, many years ago. And, and the quote is that the success of any intervention depends upon the interior condition of the intervenor, right? And his name is Bill O'Brien, and he is the former CEO, was the former CEO of Hanover Insurance and a business partner of Generon, the, the company that Joseph and I founded. I'm going to and, stop, you, stop you one second, Susan. Sure, Repeat sure. That. I think that's a repeatable moment because okay. I, I mean, Bill, stress Bill's that quote. again. Yeah, Bill's quote. Say Bill's it again. Quote. Yeah. All right. So in homage to Bill, yeah. <laughs> um, the success of any intervention is dependent upon the interior condition of the intervenor, right? So it's the inner state piece that we bring to any sort of interaction that plays a role in the outcomes that we wish to achieve. And so learning that from Bill and then applying just all the things that I went through as, you know, I have training in psychology, I became a psychotherapist and then joined Generon and how, again, linked to my purpose, that interior condition, that inner state, that inner path piece really for me became the catalyst of how we all might be more conscious with regard to how we are communicating first and foremost with each other. Because again, linking it to David Bohm and what David Bohm spent the last 10 years of his life on with regard to dialogue with, and he labeled it with a capital D, 
to distinguish it from conversation to something that would be so much deeper, underpinned by a set of principles and an awareness of what it means, an active awareness of what it means with regard to how I'm contributing. I see dialogue as more than just a conversation. It is a way of being. It is a way of how I show up and interact and listen and slow things down and suspend judgment, not in the way that we think about it, like putting it aside, but instead in David Bohm's word, suspending judgment and opinions in ways where they're like hanging in front of you for you and anyone else that you're interacting with to actually examine because it's through that vulnerability and through the differences, like that creative tension, if you will, that comes from differences of opinion, that new understandings, new realities can be birthed where that wouldn't happen with an individual. It takes the collective intelligence of the group to manifest that. I resonate so much with how you describe that. And I'm thinking people listening, some people listening will be thinking, and I've heard this before. So that's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm articulating what I've heard is, okay, Susan and Janet, that all sounds wonderful. It sounds a little kumbaya-ish. Sure. Right? That's what, what I would hear. And, you know, we've got to get things done and we're, we're, you know, we don't have time to listen to everybody's opinions and fellow, and we've got to win or we are competing. What would, what would you say to people that have that immediate reaction as we start talking about these types of things? Absolutely. It's a fabulous question. And it's something that I come across <laughs> as do you, <laughs> you know, every single day. Um, to the people who I think are, um, and I'll just say this in my own way, based on, you know, my own experience in business might feel like speed should take precedence. I would offer them to slow down. Mm -hmm for just a moment. I mean, even someone like Steve Jobs, right? Steve Jobs used to bring his um, executive team together every week for a couple of hours on a Monday. And as part of that, he would in institute, he would integrate into the agenda what he called non-time, hmm. right? And it was an opportunity for them to be sitting in a group together. This is like pre-pandemic. So they were actually in an right. office building. <laughs> right, right. And they'd be sitting in the boardroom all together in silence, doing the things that they needed to do to either read through something that had been sent in advance of the agenda, um, to just reflect, to have opportunities to kind of create a space for the me time before that then got integrated into the we time and how the we time then informed what they called the us time, right? So it's like me to we and we to org, mm -hmm. the organization, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's just some wisdom there that I, I believe we overlook because we're, we're a society that tends to reward busyness and exhaustion. But what if we were to flip that just a little bit and take even a few moments, right? So, so can you walk us through how a leader would practice dialogue? I think the first thing with regard to dialogue is really about listening. And I think we all feel like for the most part, maybe we listen pretty well. My experience is that we don't, it actually takes a lot of practice. So as a leader, how do I want to make a commitment to practice listening? And I'm not just talking about hearing what words are said through the ears. I'm talking about real, genuine, empathetic listening. What am I seeing? Like, how am I seeing the person, that person's body language, whether there's um, hesitancy, maybe opportunities for vulnerability. So I, I think the listening piece is really, really important. It's foundational to dialogue. And the only way that I think we can come to the place of genuine empathetic listening is through, and this is gonna surprise a lot of people perhaps, it's through not coming in with a knowing perspective, like I know the answer, right? It's coming in from a perspective of curiosity and it's coming in from a perspective of what might be called beginner's mind. 
And that's a really hard thing, especially for the, let's just say the upper tiers in organizations, because you're paid to know the answer. Right. And when you don't, well, maybe some negative things can potentially happen. And so here's the question I ask myself, especially when I feel triggered and especially when I come into a situation where I think I know the answer, because it happens to all of us, we're mm -hmm. all there, right? I just ask myself when I'm conscious enough to do it, what if just 10% of what the other person is saying could be true for me too, even if it's diametrically opposed? So listening from an epithet with an empathetic ear, if you will, and how that can then link to this idea of curiosity. And just like, what if, just what if? Mm -hmm. And I think part of what we don't understand oftentimes is that if I come at a conversation with that question, it's almost like somehow I'm agreeing or condoning something that maybe I don't want to agree to or condone, right? And that's not what I'm talking about here. The what if question for me, especially when I only get to a small percentage, just 10%, helps me to potentially accept another person's point of view, especially when it's completely opposite of my own. Slowing things down enough to be able to ask myself, have I really heard what's been said? Mm right? And is it my turn to speak? And if I agree, if I discern that it is, then is what I will say in service to the other person or the, or the group that I'm interacting with. So it's, it's really about that and creating opportunities to hear from people, again, linking to business and organizations who might be closer to the problem at hand right. than, right. than I am as a CEO, let's say, right? right? What I'm hearing you say is that it's also setting new types of norms. Yes. I mean, I, I understand the who you're being while you're doing, right? But there's also the norm in the group. Um, there's something about, can you say more about that? I mean, because as I, I work with a lot of executive teams, as you do, right? these aren't the norms, right? right. What you just described is probably not the norm. I don't know. I, I don't have data to support that, but I, <laughs> my experience would tell me that that's not the norm. Uh, so how do you set the norms so that becomes a way of being for how executive teams or teams operate or how leaders operate Sure. when they're in conversation? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it is about new norms. You're spot on. And I love how, how you've, um, framed that. I think one of the first things that we can do before getting into any sort of guidelines or principles, let's say that might underpin any sort of meeting is at the very beginning to take a moment to do a check-in, right? Um, because we're people first before we get the titles and the roles and the functions. So an opportunity to just check in with each other as a way to start a meeting, I think is a really great way to set the field or set the conditions for this new norm. Because when we go into relationship first, it shifts everything as opposed to just going into a conversation where we get to the agenda. When I go into a meeting and there's an agenda and we just like dive into it, that whole relational piece is, is like missing. Right. And that's the human thing that we crave, right? We, we want to be in relationship and we want to be part of the tribe. So to do something like a simple check-in, it doesn't have to be long. It can be a fun question, an icebreaker. It can just be, Hey, what's on your mind this morning? Maybe, um, your daughter just had a baby and you're a grandmother for the first time. Right. Or again, in the olden days, pre pandemic, when we all commuted, maybe that commute, that traffic was like horrific. And you just need a minute to, you know, take a breath. It's a way to get everybody present in the meeting mm -hmm. and get to that human relation piece before you even start to talk about the topics. The other thing is, I think it's important to establish some principles that underpin how you're going to have these conversations, how you're going to have these meetings, whether it's a 10 minute stand up or a two hour board meeting. And how can you co-create some sort of principles or alignment underneath how you want to be together and then create the conditions for you 
for you to actually show up that way. Because it's at the end of the day, all about that culture piece, right? And if we miss that piece, then we're just machines. Yeah. Kind of, and right? it's, you said something and it just went boom, right? Into like it exploded as you were saying it, set the field. Mm -hmm. And I think we don't pay attention as much to energy, right? And because there is an energetic field that's being set and, and we, we don't like to talk about that. That's squishy, <laughs> uh, right? I, I mean, it I, I just want to be, be frank about how I, our, our experience in organizations is these are squishy things. Like, well, what, what do you mean? I'm going to go set the field. Uh, but there's an energetic, you can walk into a meeting and you can feel the energy, you can feel the tone, you can, and, and we're energetic beings. Right. And so setting that tone and setting that energy field, part of it is how you're showing up. And that's, I think that's a lot of what you're talking about is that if you're moving to the transaction mm -hmm. and you're not paying attention to the people around you and the energy around you, you're missing something totally that can then collectively be pretty spectacular. That's what I hear Yes, as you talk. Yes, it, 100%. I love what you're saying. Like I have goosebumps because it resonates so much, Janet. And you're right. I could be 10 minutes late for a boardroom meeting and walk into that space having no idea what was discussed and no energetically right whether uh oh really what just positive. happened <laughs> all right but you know here susan as you talk the other thing i'm thinking about is i spent a lot of years apologizing for bringing up these types of things mm -hmm. and um what i'm realizing is i think we're starting to get more open to a conversation about these things because some of the things that we're doing and doing and doing aren't working right and so I think we're at a point where these um, types of conversations, which sound more squishy, are not squishy at all. Mm -hmm. And I think we're we're ripe to start having these conversations a little bit more openly and not be viewing them as, as kumbaya or squishy or um, new agey or whatever it is, that there's a recognition that, wow, there is something that's not working. <laughs> <laughs> when we're working with humans and we can't go on like this. I don't know if you're, if you're um, discovering that, but I'm, I'm starting to see that a lot more. And so I'm, I want to have these conversations. I want you to bring, bring these types of things up. So let me ask you this, what advice would you give to leaders who are trying to create these types of environments of, and use the practice of dialogue and, and do more of this? What advice would you give them? Yeah. Thank you for that question. I, I guess off the, off the top of my mind, immediately uh, the word that comes up is connection. Mm -hmm. We need to find ways to create connection, especially since the lockdowns mm -hmm. from the pandemic, right? Because look, it's innate within us to be gregarious. We want to be part of the tribe. And now we're in situations where we don't all come to a bricks and mortar office every day to be together physically. There's hybrids, there's remote, there's all kinds of things happening. So the, the word that comes up for me is, is, is really about connection and how can we create a sense of belonging in our organizations in ways where I get up in the morning and instead of saying, I have to go to work, I get to go to work because there's something meaningful there for me. And I can link this to all kinds of different statistics. One oh. of the biggest, right? Yeah. Employee engagement. Yeah. How many years have we heard from like the Gallup surveys, for example, with regard to the lack of engagement? Um, I can link it to um, hiring and retaining top talent, right? If people don't feel that sense of connection and belonging, they're gonna go where they can find it. Right. Because again, it's innate and it's what we gravitate toward. So my biggest piece of advice would be to find a way, however it works for you, because I don't like to prescribe any one way. There is not one right. way. Exactly. Whatever works for you, try to find a way to create that point of connection for your stakeholders 
in ways where they feel like they belong and they feel like they belong to a point where they can engage in meaningful ways to contribute and how that then links to performance drivers, right? Mm -hmm. To meet your objectives as an organization. And the deeper thing I'm getting out of what you're saying because of what you said earlier is it's not a list of, okay, here's the three things that you do to create connection. It's who you're being. Exactly. And that's a deeper, it takes a lot more work than, okay, I do this and I do this and I've just did all these things on my list right. and now we're connected. Exactly. And for <laughs> I love it, right? Because we're never we're, we're never only doing and we're never only being. They're like right. they're right. So for me, if I were to do like a math equation, I'd have doing, I'd have a line underneath it, I have being equals inspired action. Mm. Because for me, there's a difference between busyness being on the hamster wheel and busy through inspired action. And mm. when I'm paying attention Beautiful. to my being, right? And how I'm being in my doing. That shifts everything. I want, I don't want to be on the hamster wheel. I want to be inspired through my through the actions that I'm doing in ways that put energy toward the things that feel my heart link back to purpose where we started this conversation. Yeah. So we came full circle on this. We conversation. Did. <laughs> it's an important conversation, Susan. And I really Thank appreciate you. you having this with me today because I think um I want to have more conversations like this. I think. Uh, like I said, I think we're ripe for them. And the more we can talk about these things, the better. I'm going to ask you, because we could talk here forever about this topic, but I, I just want to ask you, what nugget of inspiration would you leave the listeners today based on the conversation we had? I would say the nugget of inspiration would be to trust yourself. Hmm. Trust yourself. Your body never lies. And you know in your heart of hearts what's happening. So if you can trust yourself and in that be vulnerable enough to choose a different way or a different path or a different interaction, follow that. Listen to your heart. I love it. Listen to your heart. It's interesting. It kind of goes back full circle to your purpose right where you trusted yourself and trusted your purpose from the very beginning from that billboard you saw so i love it thank you so much my wise woman for being with us today thank you so much i truly appreciate you thank you